go to Hamid. Thank you very much. Um, nice meeting everybody virtually and uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's an honor uh, to uh, talk tonight about some of my uh, experiences. Uh, I guess I should start from the presentation, right? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Uh, do I have control or how do I do I share? Uh, you should be able to share. Okay. Okay, I think I'm sharing. Um, okay. Um, Excellent. So, the reason I got um, interested in this uh, topic specifically is as engineer, uh, when you start your career, you make decision every day, of course, because it's design part of your life. But when you start moving to managerial, none of us really are trained for how to make decision uh, in the managerial level. And unfortunately, in the companies, the higher I went into the chain, I realized that a lot of decision uh, at the top level, even at the CEO levels, are made without really uh, doing uh, proper uh, homeworks. So when I started my MBA, I, I wanted to focus on this to find out what is a quantitative way of making decision properly. And uh, almost for three years, I, I work on this topic for research, read lots of book on that. And also in the past 30 years, uh, one of the topic of my interest has been uh, psychology that uh, has a direct relationship with the topic I want to I want to talk tonight. So the topic of the discussion is a quantitative strategic decision making. Um, you know, we in, in our life, we always constantly are making decision. No, no doubt about it. I mean, from day in the morning, when you wake up, you make a decision of what to eat for breakfast or not to eat breakfast, what road to uh, take to work, what to do at work and all of those things. And, but uh, for uh, early human beings, decision making uh, was much more uh, costly because a wrong decision for early humans could have uh, cost their lives basically so there was a problem with that and human over the course of hundreds of thousands of years they started basically to develop some mechanism internally in order to make decision very quickly to save their lives and upon that, they had to believe some sort of a, a system could have been a real uh, system or could have been a false uh, system in order to be able to rely to that system in, uh, to make quick decisions. Now, uh, we do that in businesses today. We always go back to our previous experiences and make decisions. So that experience as an early human really helped us also back in 17, 18 and early 19 centuries. But the problem is now businesses are becoming more competitive. Businesses are becoming more um, complex and it's hardly situation that are being repetitive uh, and past experiences really is not helping that much anymore. And in, in, a, in a way, actually, they are creating biases inside us and that biases are going to hurt us actually. Uh, quick decision making is no longer uh, the name of the game. And uh, since the industrial revolution happened, uh, the decision making process is, is constantly changing. And in a way, we are kind of a behind and we, we learn uh, based on try and error, and that's very costly. And so the idea here is how could we do that uh, to avoid that? One of the things you always hear uh, from a lot of people, uh, they're referring to nature as being a miracle and things are in nature are perfect and we have to build things exactly like nature. But the reality, uh, when you look at it as an engineering point of view, nature actually is not perfect. Um, it's full of uh, incorrect decisions. Uh, many of our scientists actually back from 16th, 17th, 18th century, if you go and do a Google, you will see they died very young, a lot of them in duels. And these are the guys who came up with uh, equations, life-changing equations, right? 
but one afternoon they get pissed off at each other and they invite each other to duels and they kill each other basically. So we're not very good in decision making. Doesn't matter what is our level of education. Uh, in terms of efficiency, photosynthesis is the source of energy in the world. Everything we have comes from sun and converted to uh, energy by uh, plants. Uh, calculation for the efficiency of a plant converting en 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 energy of sun to uh, hydrocarbon basically is 3%. 97% of the energy that is reaching any leaf is, is lost because the plant really uh, does not do its job correctly. And uh, we make all kinds of unhealthy choices every day. How many medical doctors you know that they smoke? I know some of them. So just knowledge is not enough. Just relying on something that has been working for decades and centuries and thousands of years is not enough. We got to do something differently. And that's the topic of this discussion. Okay, so let's talk about a strategy. I mean, all of these words are known to us, but I want to do a quick uh, review of the strategy. So a strategy is not the goal of where to get. Uh, a strategy is the tool, uh, uh, basically something like a map that helps us to get to the goal. And uh, quantitative is uh, basically to be able to mathematically model something and to be able to measure one thing against another thing uh, and basically removing any sort of a bias that might have. And decision making can be anything, you know. Anything that you're trying to solve a problem, doesn't matter if small or big, uh, it's a process of decision making. And um, knowledge is important, uh, gathering of the fact is important, and all of them really result into an action that we're taking, and that is called our decision. Now, when we want to make a decision, we are uh, basically um, faced with two different type of a decision that we have to make. Some decisions are tactical, some decisions are adaptive. And this is very important to recognize when you're trying to solve a problem, managerial problem in your team or in your company, you have to recognize if this is a tactical problem or this is a adaptive problem. The difference is a tactical, a tactical problem is um, something that you're trying to reach a goal. And that goal is, is measurable. For example, you say, I want to lose weight. And these are the months that I want to do that. And every month I want to lose this amount of uh, weight. So it's a tactical way of doing. You have to get a regime, do exercise, and all of those things to reach your target. However, other type of a decision making that are adaptive, they are more about processes and how you have to change a process. For example, if you have an issue with drawings at work being uh, uh, duplicate and nobody knows what drawing is, is the right drawing, a tactical uh, answer to that problem is you assign somebody and you say you're in charge of all of the drawing and anybody wants to have a drawing, uh, you give that latest version of the drawing to that person. But the adaptive way of solving that problem is to utilize a configuration management system that where everybody can go upload the latest version. There is a history of all of the drawing changes and everything. So you're changing a process basically. And uh, in a way, changing a process and a baseline thinking is, is the foundation for really a planning and reaching the target. Why we're not always adaptive to everything? Because it's exhausting, you know? For you to drive every day to come to work, you don't need a checklist in front of you uh, to check, you know, check the brake, check the lock, check the key in order to start driving. Uh, therefore, you really just uh, approach it in a tactical way, putting your switch and start driving. Versus a pilot in the airplane, it's a completely different complex situation with the life of many people. So what the pilot needs to do is a complete checklist 
that the pilot needs to go through before it starts flying. So number one, whenever you're faced with a decision, you have to make a choice is if this is a tactical decision or it's an adaptive decision. Now, uh, let's assume I want to solve the problem. And what are the steps to do that? And it's important to go through these steps. Even some of them look very trivial, but by writing it down, uh, you actually uh, expose yourself to some hidden part of the process that you were not aware of it. First of all, you need to really identify the problem. And that is very important. A lot of us in the engineering world, we really don't spend time to identify the problem. And we usually start backward where a solution exists. I give you an example. If a friend of you come to you and say, hey, I got a new job. It's uh, I live in South uh, Los Angeles and the new job is in North LA and uh, I don't know what to do. Uh, answer could be easily well, it's better to get a used hybrid car because the low consumption in energy and it's used and it's not costly and all of those things. But you didn't really answer uh, your friend's uh, problem. Your friend's problem is not what car to choose. All you did was you gave that friend a choice of a car. Your friend's problem is what mode of transportation does he or she need? She, should she use a car, a uh, subway, bus, uh, Uber, carpool? And when a car is uh, chosen as a method of transportation, then your options are correct. We always jump to solve something that comes to our mind first and usually that's not the real problem we're trying to uh, solve. So let's identify the problem, ask always what problem I'm trying to solve. Then collect information and identify all of the alternatives that could exist. Doesn't matter how crazy some of those alternatives are, just write them down, you can cross it always later. Uh, you have some evidence, some evidence are based on other people talking, some evidences are based on the numbers you have, you categorize those evidence, which one you can rely more. And among all of the alternatives that you pick, uh, pick your favorite one based on your experience, based on what you know work for the company, take action, review the design process, and uh, basically uh, continue this loop until you get to the final decision. Now, um, if, if at the end the decision has not meant uh, has not uh, met the objective, uh, your go back to collecting more information, uh, picking other alternatives that you choose, or, or uh, changing your weight system. Maybe you gave uh, weight to the wrong uh, parameters, basically, and you need to, to look at it differently. But this loop needs to continue. Uh, one of the common mistakes is at work, we do this loop, and uh, another um, crisis happens and we need to leave this and move to the next project and so forth. And works are never done completely. Even if you don't have the time to continue working on this, you got to delegate it to somebody to reach to a closure, basically. Now, what hurts this loop is gathering unbiased factual approach, you know? The problem is when we work in a company, the more we work, we develop this kind of a bias uh, facts. For example, uh, employee X gives you some numbers and in your mind, you always say, oh yeah, he's very conservative or she's very conservative. Um, it's her numbers are always high. I need to consider something lower. This is a bias you just created in your mind and it's not a wrong bias. It comes based on many years of working with that individual, but uh, this time you could be wrong and the number could be right and therefore it's going to cost you the decision that you are making. Therefore, you really have to look at each uh, facts that you're gathering in an unbiased way without really considering uh, who developed it. And then you have to adopt to a quantitative approach. Uh, one of the things that we do is because we value opinion of one employee over another employee, again, based on the experiences we have, 
we tend to make decision that is more toward uh, favoring the employee that we trust. And the best way to uh, approach the problem is to develop a quantitative approach. And uh, most likely, uh, you're going to get the results that might be in line with the employee that you trust. So it's another thumbs up for your uh, relationship based on trust, basically. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, now, one of the main important thing on the quantitative analysis is to start measuring. And you could say, how could I measure things? You know, what can I measure? And in reality, everything can be measured. Actually, there is a book in one of my references at the end that I show, and that's exactly the title. Everything can be measured. And if you cannot measure it, maybe you haven't defined the parameter very correctly. Uh, for example, time is one of the most abstract concepts. You know, you cannot grab the time. You cannot box it, package it, mail it, ship it. It doesn't exist, frankly. But we came up with the way to measure it and very accurately as a standard around the whole world. It's the same thing you hear all the time that uh, we have to measure our performance. And the question always is, what is performance? You know what? You need to define the performance. The performance for a production line is how many units are produced with the acceptable quality. Uh, performance for a design team is a completely different thing. It has nothing to do with the number of drawing release. And uh, therefore, you have to make sense of the performance uh, what it means for your department and how you can measure it, basically. Uh, now, when you have all of these things, still your biggest barrier is your brain. Our brain, uh, over the course of 100,000 years of uh, evolution, uh, basically developed two different methods of uh, making decision, and it is called System 1 and System 2. This research was done by Daniel Kahneman, uh, who is a Stanford psychologist and won a Nobel Prize in economy uh, in 2004, actually. A, a psychologist who won Nobel Prize in economy, it it's, looks very strange, but actually his research was all focused on decision making and therefore how, as a human, we make a, a economical decision for ourselves. And, uh, Basically, he developed these two systems and he calls it system one and system two. And system one or our brain is uh, focused on uh, quick decision making, a system of flight and fight, basically. And in, um, um, in ter terminology, it is called also uh, reptilian response. So it's coming from our uh, uh, unconscious and it's full of biases because in the old days uh, when we were living in caves, we knew that if we are hearing a lion and the lion is coming to the cave, is going to you know kill us. Therefore, we develop this mechanism in our brain that whenever we hear uh, the sound of a lion, we just run. You know, we have been doing that for hundreds, thousands of years, and it worked. Uh, also, our unconscious uh, pathway is giving us uh, anger. Anger is a mechanism, is a defense mechanism. It's very quick. It's very determinal. Fight and uh, flight and fight, of course, is very animalistic. It's common between all animals. Uh, system two is a cognitive bias. It's something that is developed for uh, human, basically, specifically, and animals don't have it. And it comes based on your uh, conscious and in your conscious, you can debate, you can have reflection and you can have biases and that's your personal style. For example, if I eat uh, a bad food in a certain restaurant, I'm not going to go there and, and try the food again. Right. And that's a bias and it's a personal style and it uh, serves me very well. And uh, it, it brings a lot of advantages. Uh, in the in a conscious way to be able to collaborate, consider other options, and develop our own personality. And in between, uh, there is always something called the preconscious pathway, which is basically your uh, gut feeling. 
you know, we all have. Oh, my God, feeling tell me to do this in our decision making. A lot of times, actually, the way that we describe God feeling is nothing but the past experience we had in the past 30 years, combination of all kind of a different scenarios you had, and you combine it together and you call it God feeling. Now, the out outcome uh, goes and create our char character. Our character is a summation of our personality and the experiences we had in life. And therefore, it gives again a feedback to our cognitive and uh, reptilian response. Also, on the left side, I want you to pay attention to three boxes that I have of how your mind control your behavior, which is impacted by environment. And this is very important. So, if you want to look at the combination, there is a study that, uh, for example, if you look at happiness, as an attribute, 50% of happiness is really genetic. You're born a happy person or you're not born a happy person. And 40% of that really depends on your own effort of how to make yourself happy. And 10% really depend on the environmental condition. So as you can see, uh, happiness as an attribute really have uh, some unconscious uh, material in it, which is the part that you are born with it and some part that you can contribute to it, which is the conscious pathway, the 40%, but there is always an impact from environment as well. But it's very important to recognize yourself as a character, who you are, that you are a personality that you are born with and experiences that you collected over the year. Now, therefore, we are going to have biases. There is no way somebody can say, I have no bias. Uh, 100 years of evolution gave you bias, it's in your unconscious, and you cannot do anything about it. But you can recognize it, and you can develop this quantitative method in order to be able to measure uh, the effect of your decision and not act based on biases you have. There are 18 different types of biases uh, in psychology, but three uh, main important ones for this discussion today uh, that uh, happen a lot to managers are anchoring, uh, heuristic, and projection. Well, anchoring is going back to uh, the fact that uh, you're basically uh, focusing on one thing and trying to ignore everything else. And in anchoring, basically, if you have 10 parameters, you really, one of them for you, you believe, as I said, it's a biased way, you believe that Parameter number two is the most important parameter. Therefore, you're not paying attention to the other nine parameters. You're not collecting data from them. You're not really looking at the pattern. And uh, that happens a lot. And usually we call it, hey, based on my experience, temperature doesn't matter, you know? But this time it could. Uh, heuristic goes back to the history, basically from the word that is coming, based on, uh, uh, the past history you have as an experience, basically. The type of uh, problems you solve, the type of a uh, reaction you got working with different type of people, you know? And those are all there, and sometimes it uh, create uh, prejudice in, in our mind and how to look at problems, basically. And uh, projection is uh, something that happens a lot also. We try to look at the world the way we like to look at the world. For example, a lot of times managers uh, already made a decision about their problem and they still go through the phases to collect data and information. But since they already made their decision, they always try to find the right data to validate their decision, basically. You know, and that projection is very common. And again, these biases really coming from your unconscious and you have no control over them. They find a way uh to get to you but the only way you can uh, you can control them is by mitigating them and uh, trying to create alternatives using your system two of uh, reasoning you know thinking writing down things and collecting data a statistical viewpoint everything is very important now 
I, I explained all of these things, but these are good examples. For example, anchoring, a very good example about anchoring is if somebody offered you a t-shirt for $100, there is no way you're going to buy a t-shirt for $100. But if somebody shows you a t-shirt for $1,200 and you say, well, this is too expensive, I don't want to buy it. But then the, uh, he or she says, well, I have a, a cheaper one. And this is a cheaper one for 100. Most likely, you're going to buy the 100 dollars uh, t-shirt because your mind uh, baseline was set up as 1200 dollars to be expensive. Therefore, 100 compared to 1200 is a very good good price. And um, um, so uh, the the other thing is a heuristic that I said as as history always stay with us. I always say in the companies that when you're trying to get a promotion or apply for a new position, higher position, uh, the, the person who applies from outside with uh, two pages of resume always have a better chance than you that have been working in the company for 10 years. Because the person who comes for an interview with two pages of resume and a smile uh, is, doing, is going to do fantastic, but for you, and what they remember all of the malfunctions that your work had done in the past 10 years, rather than all of the praises that you have. So that's why, uh, honestly, a lot of people in order to get promotion and higher level positions, they go to different companies because they have a better chance in that. And uh, projection, I, I think I had a good example on that. Uh, uh, for example, um, most of the time they tell you, do not go grocery shopping when you are uh, hungry. That's exactly because of the projection, because you go and you buy all kind of a different food and you come home and you have $300 worth of food that you bought, half of them junk food. And after one meal, you just look at your fridge and say, why did I buy all of those things? So your, your feelings always get a way to control you basically. Now, how do I do that? How do I control all of these things? So now I'm aware I'm a product of bias. I cannot do anything about it. It has been planted in my mind since 100,000 years ago, and uh, but I have to live with it now. And for many, many years, 90,000 plus years, it served me very well, by the way. It's very difficult to live it and go to the next step of, of uh, evolution of human being and forget about that part. So I have to live with it. Therefore, I have to be able to control it. So one way is uh, data gathering and a statistical data always matter. By the way, you don't need to be very, very accurate. I give you an example that happened in, uh, in my work recently. A couple of days ago, we had uh, another company approaching us and uh, showing very enthusiastically that they want to in, get into a partnership with us on a project and all of those things. And to us, it was very strange that, you know, we don't know them that much. They never work with us. Why they are so enthusiastic? There are millions of the companies in the United States, literally like that. So I was one of them. I said, you know, why? Why they are interested? I don't really understand that. Why we are that unique to them? So I did, uh, I came home. So that was my bias already in my mind that that's, this doesn't make sense. And I said, you know what? I need to put everything on writing. So I went online, did some research. I found that actually there are 17.5 million registered companies in the United States. Out of that, only 0.5% of those companies have employees between 100 and 250, which is our company, basically. So that will reduce 17.5 uh, million to around 550,000 companies. Now, out of these companies, I told myself, you know what, um, uh, from 100 to 25, to 250, Let's assume it's a normal distribution, exactly what you see on the top. And we are at 140 range because we are 140 people. And based on that, somewhere around probability of uh, a company our size is about 10%. So now I reduce to from 500,000, I reduce to 50,000. Other, other assumptions I made, you know, how many of them are in defense? 
how many of them are working on system integration, how many of them are in military. So I, I added or multiply all of those factors as I was going. Guess what? At the end, I the number that I reached was five. I double it for just being, uh, you know, um, level of uh, confidence. So I said, well, you know what? That's why they are interested to us, not because there are 17.5 million companies in the United States. And why am I one of those 17 and a half million? Because when I narrow it down to my industry, to my size, to my location and everything, it turned out to be between five to 10 companies. You know, being selected as one out of five, it's much easier to understand than one out of 17 and a half. But I wouldn't think like that if I wouldn't sit down and start writing down all of those numbers. My bias was telling me this, this is too good to be true. They, they perhaps planning to embezzle us or something like that you know and your mind always goes to the direction that to protect you uh, the other way is crowdsourcing crowdsourcing always work listening to employees listening to other people and gathering information uh, really really helps the best way of crowdsourcing what i like about crowdsourcing is not averaging the data averaging the information people give you actually i really like to put it in a normal distribution and look at my worst case scenario and my best case scenario. And I know the situation is not going to be better than the best and is not going to be worse than the worst based on a normal distribution. I will be somewhere in between. And the rest, you got to basically deal with it based on risk mitigation. Uh, as much as I said, God's feeling coming from biases and uh, it's not really scientific, but it has a very good value because it's your experience, because it's what guides you to consider something and you should not dismiss your gut's feeling. So basically you got to collect a statistical data, put a value for it, do a crowdsourcing, put a value for it and do gut's feeling. And this, this could be weighted and you add it up and give it a score. Now, uh, the weight has to be alternative, uh, alternating also, not, should not, it should not be constant all the time. For example, if you're starting thinking of creating a new venture and introducing a new product to your product line, a statistical data is important, crowdsourcing is important, but gut feeling is very important. That's where actually you put the risk. And as you know, the higher the risk, the reward is higher. The history has shown that the CEOs that are very conservative usually uh, are not a winner for their company as well. Now, out of all of these parameters, you develop a number and what you need to do is you need to calibrate your number. And the calibration comes with the experience with, uh, if you continue doing this way uh, during your career and every time when you calculate something and you see the results one year, two years later in your project, then you can always come back and say, well, you know what, when I guessed uh, it is 70 out of 100, it really resulted in 50 out of 100. So you develop some sort of a correction factor for yourself. Uh, if you really are serious about that bias adjustment, actually there are some standard tests that you can take. And uh, there are some standard texts. If you search it online, you will find it. There are like 20 to 25 questions. And they ask very general question. When was the Waterloo War? Uh, what is the lowest temperature in North Pole? Things like that, basically. Very independent, irrelevant, uh, typical question. And then based on that, they give you a bias factor, actually, that uh, what way you are biased. Are you more optimistic or are you more pessimistic? And based on that, you can always calibrate your, uh, your uh, decisions, basically. Uh, sorry. Now, so we talk about uh, identification of variables, which is very important. You have to find as many as independent variable. One of the things that I always see in the industry, specifically for us as an engineer, we always consider things are uh, against each other, quality versus cost. If I spend too much money 
on a product is going to be high quality. If the CEO is asking me to cut cost of the product development, I'm going to have a lower quality product. I want to tell you, don't, don't do that. Try to look at the world in an orthogonal fashion. You know, performance and trustworthy do not need to be at the same direction. They could be perpendicular to each other. And you can easily then define your world into a four zones of low and high for trustworthiness and low and high for performance, and then find a realistic uh, zone for your operation. Uh, as engineers, you are all familiar with Six Sigma methodology. It has been around for uh, many years. It's easy to put all of your parameter and compare them uh, individually with each other and come up with the highest weight. It's always uh, good to put a value proposition. And the best way to do the value proposition is these days, you see a lot of surveys around and they give you a ranking from one to 10 or one to five. Uh, typically, a uh, recommendation is don't do that kind of a value proposition. Always go from one, three, nine. One, for example, for poor, three for good, and nine for excellent. And the reason for this um, jump from three to nine is because then uh, you really give nine uh, scoring to parameters that have a huge impact and effect, basically and not easily giving those scores to, to any kind of a parameters or outcome, basically. Now, uh, when we are trying to look at a strategy, uh, you always have uh, two parameters that are very important with each other. If I wanna have a successful company, it's not only system and processes, uh, which is your organization chart, processes, infrastructure that you have in the company, but people and culture really play an important role. Uh, what is your recruitment technology? How do you retain your employee compensation plan? How do you create motivation? Uh, what is your leadership strategy? And all of those things together. I, when I started my career uh, 30 years ago, uh, fax machine was a miracle. Maybe some of you are in the same age as me, and there was no mobile phone. As a matter of fact, there was no PC when uh, using the mainframe computer uh, was majestic, basically. And when PC came to our company, we had one PC and 16 engineers sharing it, basically. And uh, we didn't have the tools. You know, we had to do drawing with uh, with pencil and uh, and on a special table and a special dr drawing. And it took you know two weeks to do a drawing. Now you have computer, you have Excel sheet. I mean, you can do magic really in half an hour. Uh, so I personally believe that technologies are not our is not our bottleneck anymore with all of the tools, engineering tools we have. Human behavior is our bottleneck right now. You know, the amount of the friction between people working in a company and uh, people are upset at each other and they don't want to work with each other and things like that, you know. So you really need to start from a vision. With that vision, create a goals, what, what good looks like at the end. And based on that, have a plan and based on your plan, create action and therefore reach success. And as you can see, as you start from vision, uh, you have to start uh, delegating uh, to more people and more people. And when it comes to action, it's going to be, you know, a lot of people basically getting involved. And uh, the, the history is full of uh, good plans that resulted in bad outcome or bad plan that resulted in good output. So. It's a bold statement, but there is no direct relationship between planning, good planning and good output. You cannot say because I did everything on the program management, I plan everything perfectly, so my, my uh, outcome should be good. There is no relationship. The relationship of a plan coming as a good output lies on um, your strategy and action and how you did it. If you go to the PM, uh, PMP uh, website, PMI website, a program management institute, uh, there is a, they have 
by the way, they have tons of statistical data about projects and ranking and all kinds of things. But one of the things caught my eyes was average in the world, uh, considering the dollar weighted value of each project, the success rate of the projects worldwide is 60% is only 60%. That means any project that you're going to start in your uh, company, if you are over 60%, you're beating the odds actually. So based on that, developing a, a, a basically success plan is, is very important. One of the things that I, I really like about looking at the, at the things as a combination of four items, you know, you can have a good plan, a good outcome, bad plan, good outcome. If you keep this very lively, you are uh, you're not any more linear. You know, you're in a space that is two dimensional, and uh, you you have choices that are m way way more than a linear thinking choices. Basically, now decision accuracy always comes with the cost. And one of the problems we engineers have, we're obsessed with accuracy, of course. We always want everything to be accurate. However, business world and our program managers never are uh, interested in that level of accuracy. One of the things I always exercise is I always tell my team that give me the answer that you think 85% is correct today is better than an answer that is 99% correct three weeks from now because then I can take that, run it through a risk management system and define what crisis I can have. I'm not saying we, you should stop and never get to the accuracy level you want, but that work can continue in parallel, basically. Uh, we have been constantly told from school that uh, life of a strategy is like playing chess, you know? And that's a mentality that you know, uh, been implemented in our brain, especially as an engineer, where in reality, life is more like a poker, not like a chess. Chess is very uh, reasonable game. There are certain outcome. I mean, you might move uh, one component and there might be 50 different way that the, the, uh, your opponent is going to play, but at least it's a finite number of 50. You know, but when you look at life as a poker game, uh, the number of the possibilities combined with the emotion and decision making of the person is way, way much higher. Uh, Daniel Kahneman in his book, um, uh, the Nobel Prize winner that I told you, has a very interesting formula. It says success is equal hard work plus luck. And it says more success is a little bit, a little more hard work plus a lot of more luck, basically. And that basically tries to tell you that there is no linear relationship. There is not a chess game. It's a poker. It depends on luck a lot. Now, that doesn't mean that I have to leave everything alone and say, well, you know, the rest is luck. Uh, yes, a lot of it is luck. Bill Gates is Bill Gates because he was at the right time at the right place. Everybody says that, right? But I can mitigate my risk. The mistake from competitors of Bill Gates at the time Microsoft was created was they did not mitigate their risk. They always thought they are the best, you know, and that, that's, the, that's the wrong approach. You always have to mitigate your, your risk and assume that what will happen if, if there is an error here, how am I going to recover from that? And I believe personally that really is a big difference between a good manager and not a good manager when it comes to risk and how they can manage risks, basically. Now, when I identify risk and threats, there are uh, different uh, steps that I can take. Uh, I can either avoid the risk completely if it's possible, but sometimes that's not possible. That's the best approach. If it's not possible and I'm exposed to risk, I have to measure uh, different methodology to reduce the effect of the risk. Now, after reducing the effect of the is a risk, there is certain level of risk left that I cannot do anything with it. And that is called risk management at this point. 
I give you a good example. For example, you are working with a small team of 10 people, all of them very smart. You need every single of them. And for you to avoid uh, losing them, losing one of them is a risk. So what do you do to avoid that risk? You make sure they are paid well, they have good bonuses, good compensation, so you don't have those risks. But uh, you cannot pay them unlimited money. There is always, you know, some scenario, somebody's getting married, somebody wants to go live to the, to the close to the family and all of those things. The only way to do that eventually uh, to manage your risk, to be always ready for somebody else to step in from another project uh, and or uh, overstaff it a little bit. I know overstaffing is not the word that uh, people like to hear, but sometimes it's necessary depending on the on the um, value of the project for the company. And um, in general, when you're dealing with the risk, it's 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 multidimensional. It's just not simply as, uh, hey, I, can, I should go hire people. You really have to break it down. You have to look at it all kind of a different way in order uh, to determine some simple parameter and make that simple parameters combine together uh, to create a simple model that if X1 happen, X2 will happen, and if X2 happen, X, X3 will happen, and all of those things. These are simplification, very simple linear model. They are not highly accurate, but they give you a capability of looking uh, at a complex model in a way that quickly you can do what if scenarios. Uh, some of the analysis that I always uh, use for uh, my work is uh, traditional linear model that we are all familiar with it. Um, Bayesian theory is uh, one of my favorite statistical method. Uh, we always go calculate the probability of one thing happening over another thing, but in reality, uh, no probability is independent and they are all dependent on the pre-existing condition. So the true way of calculating probability of something is to use the Bayesian uh, theory, basically. Uh, game theory is another favorite of mine because it gives you the capability of looking of your decision making in a two dimensional rather than one dimensional. And these days uh, there are uh, several software uh, startup companies I had the pleasure to work with one of them that they actually have this artificial uh, software that they develop and you basically put some parameters inside that software and uh, you also tell your decision and the software calculate the, the rate of your success and uh, constantly as your variables are changing or you have more input or even the, con the software is uh, smart enough to go and review all of the news online and based on that constantly changing the probability of success in their model actually. Uh, it's very interesting. Now, if I wanna summarize it quickly here before I go to the next topic, uh, you need to define what kind of a decision you are making. Is it a tactical decision or is it adaptive? Tactical was something that is local, you can make a decision for it, somebody can do it. Adaptive is more process oriented. Collect the information, either through crowdsourcing, statistical, or any other method, and uh, define, quantify your goals. It has to be goals that you can uh, measure. I'm sure you have uh, exposed to this kind of things that I see requirements all every day in my life as an engineer. Requirements come written as the performance shall be better than previous design. This is not a measurable goal. What does better mean? You know, so you have to define something that is that is uh, measurable. Always create an analytical model as simple as possible and combine them together to become complex. And what if scenarios is the best uh, uh, tool in order to really look at all of your risks, basically. And to analyze the result, traditional way, artificial intelligence, your experience, all combined together is important and you always have to modify your decision based on the results that you're obtain obtaining. You might make a conclusion to go some way and after a month you see you are not getting the results and you need to come back and change your direction. And um, it, generally in summary we can say a successful leader is somebody that has business knowledge, analytical skills 
And I want to add something that is uh, called knowledge in psychology. And the reason for that is because you have to work with human being and uh, we are very complex uh, emotional uh, creatures, basically. And uh, it's not easy and you have to be able to get the best out of your team, you know. Now, back to bias. Um, the whole point of this quantitative approach is to eliminate biases, you know. Let's define the biases. Let's assume I have this target practicing, as you can see on the left side. And uh, at the bottom left, I have uh, five, uh, six uh, bullet. They all to the center. Great. So that's the definition of a precise, accurate targeting. If I come above, I still have the six bullet close to each other, but they are not on the target. So they are precise. They are precise because they are, you know, close to each other, but they are biased. They are shifted a little bit, you know, and if it is biased and not precise, that means they are shifted in one direction, but scattered. And if they are uh, not precise or, uh, but accurate, that means they are within, for example, uh, circle one or circle two, but scattered everywhere, basically. Now, here is the interesting thing. Look at this picture. On the next slide, I'm going to remove all of the lines. And if I remove all of the target lines, on the left side, on the left column, since you don't have any more lines, the top one and the bottom one, the one that it says bias precise or accurate precise, they look like each other. So that's the danger with making bias decision because making bias decision look very good. It look consistent, it look uh, comprehensive, it looks integrated, but when you go back to put the lines in it, you will realize you're off the target. So to prevent that, uh, uh, find the source of bias, number one. You know, wh why do you have this bias? Is it a past, past experience you had? Uh, you're not getting the right data from somebody. You're talking to the people that they all repeat your uh, theory, you know? And then calibrate your decision making process, collect proper data, and of course, utilize quantitative approach. Uh, your decision making lack quantitative approach. Uh, a lot of times, a right decision before you decide what is the right decision for a problem, you need to really sit down and think what the problem is that I'm trying to solve. I cannot tell you how many times I had discussion with uh, people who were reporting to me or or my bosses actually, and they would come to me and say, Ahmed, I need you to do this. Uh, and I basically think about it and it kind of doesn't make sense to me. My, my question always back to my boss is, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Because you just came and gave me a solution. Why don't you tell me your problem? Uh, and let's see what is the best solution for it. Uh, and, and that way is, is the best way to, to approach any problem rather than taking a solution and then building a problem around it. I give you an example. This is a problem. Um, it's a question actually. There is uh, this uh, individual named Tom. He lives in Cleveland suburbs. He has a wife and a 10 year old son. The name of the son is Ashton. Uh, Tom works as a technician in a small manufacturing firm. If you go to Ohio, Michigan area, there are plenty of firms like that, that they service automotive industry. Uh, his wife, Jessica, works as a part-time uh, babysitter, basically, having, uh, you know, doing home babysitting part-time. Uh, and the question is, do they have a dog? So think about that question. So, and you can answer it two different ways. You can say, yes, they have a dog or no, they don't have a dog. Or you can give me a probability. You can say, well, 25% they have a dog, 75% they have a dog, 50% they have a dog, things like that, you know? I like to see the answer to that at the QA uh, toward the end. I think there is, a, there is a way you can type your answer. 
Now, for me uh, to be able to rule out bias, there are two things I need to do. Number one, equip myself with all of these quantitative tools that I know around me. And I, as an engineer, by the way, we have great access to, to all of those uh, tools, you know? But the most important part is, is to make it a habit. That's the difficult part, you know, because we're born with biases. Biases served us and we're quick to jump to a bias. How to make it habit is you have to create a cue for yourself in your mind by, by having a keyword. Oh, this is a decision. I have to make a decision. Emphasize on the word decision. So it forces you to, to employ new uh, numerical approach, basically. Make it that attractive and make it easy. Don't go through complex problem solving situation and make it rewarding to yourself. This is a habit loop for anything you want to do, by the way. It's not just for your uh, bias thinking. And if you really want to change yourself, so because when you do habit, it's not necessarily that you're changing yourself. You're just changing your behavior. Habit is just a behavior. But if you really want to change yourself, you have to go inside to your identity and who you are and start changing that. And uh, how can how can you do that? I give you an example. For example, to quit smoking, you can create this habit, right? Whenever I talk about smoking, I better go somewhere that smoking is not allowed. And then I give myself a chocolate as a reward and things like that, right? That's a habit you develop for not a smoking, but it does not change you as a smoker. You are still in a smoker who do not smoke. That's the difference. In order to quit smoking, you need to become somebody who hates smoking. If you want to run a marathon, you need to become a runner first. To have a positive view about things, you need to become a positive person in general about life, about everything that is happening around you, you know? So to, to adopt a new habit, you really need to change your belief system, you know? If, if you wanna lose weight and getting a diet, it's just a habit. You have to really believe, you should believe that losing weight is healthy for me and I'm, I wanna have a healthy life, you know? And I start from there, work on yourself in that level because once you achieve that, then following habit, it comes with it very quickly. Now, the difference between us and animal is, um, you know, animal, they, they have simple needs, food, reproduction, very simple. So therefore, uh, they adopt these systems and they put it in their DNA. You know, when a bee is born, a bee knows exactly what to do has a span life of two, three weeks. Some of them are guarding the hive. Some of them go collect, uh, you know, go to flowers and collect, uh, collect it. And they all know what to do exactly. Uh, there is no lawyers bee. There is no doctor bees. There is no engineer bees. You know, it's, it's in their DNA and they will do it. Uh, it's full of biases, basically, but the biases works for them. But for us, the source of bias is much more complex because our needs are much more higher. You have a, a conscious that sometimes consciously you make biases, but most of the time, that's not the reason. Most of the time, the source of your biases come from your subconscious. And big part of that subconscious is the collective subconscious. Collective subconscious is something like the society that you grow up. You know, if you have been living in uh, Europe uh, and your ancestor for thousands of years, there is a way of life in, uh, tattooed in your DNA for the past thousand years. And it comes with some biases and it's there and you cannot really take it out of your body. Uh, those are collective subconscious. Collective subconscious is basically something people as a society, when they are together, they all agree with it, basically. Individual subconscious is something that has been de developed during your childhood and either trauma or good stories or successes and all of those things. Now, uh, since humans are more complex and for us, survival is not just food and reproduction, 
and we need to be in a team environment. That's the reason that we live all together. Uh, several studies, uh, Stanford actually run some of these studies, prove that the best size team that has the most efficiency in terms of working together in a complex way is a team of 150, which it makes sense. Look at big companies, how inefficient they are, and look at the small companies, how uh, overworked they are. You know, 150, I work for a company that is 100. Uh, 40 some people it's honestly it's perfect uh, out of my 30 years of work this is the best company i've worked so far uh, so for us as a human being getting together and really work as a team our ancestor invented language storytelling gossips to social bond you know there is a theory actually uh, that uh, gossip is not a negative attribute for a human being. It's a positive attribute because that, that's like a social glue that bond us together, basically. And um, it created our social, uh, we created a social uh, order in our life that is purely arbitrary. You know, all of the human laws that you see today, religion, freedom, equality, all of those things are things that we arbitrarily really created them and they don't exist. And in reality, what I mean is you cannot go somewhere and say, give me one pound of religion or how much is human law, you know, because there is no quantity of them available. These are some values that we are created in our mind and we're ruling our society based on that. And these are basically examples of biases, by the way. The reason I brought up this is because these are the example of biases that are good. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with creating a human law. Nothing wrong with having freedom, religion, equality. So that makes it much more difficult to basically wash out a bias as a bad attribute from ourselves. And, you know, say as a modern human, we should not have bias. That is not true. You know, it, it really served our, our society very well. All we need to do is to be aware of it, see where it's helping us, where it's not help helping us. There is a chart I like, I like to show at the top right. And as you can see in this chart, uh, you know, there are three uh, arrows on that uh, target panel. And if you count uh, the score, you have one at the 10-point uh, score and two at five-point score, so totally add up 20. Your bias is like a distorted version of that target practice panel. Basically, it shapes the lines, whatever it likes, in order to give you the highest score. And based on this system, you get 30 and you are the winner in that world, basically. But in reality, we know no target panel looks like that. So our, our bias are basically made in order to help us to be a hero in, in our story of our life, basically. And they are doing a great job, by the way. But we got to be aware when it is useful and when it is not useful uh, to use them. Now, uh, one thing uh, I want to end the discussion with is uh, traditionally, we always try to line up the parameters as either they are together or they are opposite of each other. Development cost, quality. But really in a modern world, we should look at parameters not being aligned, but being or misaligned or uh, be more orthogonal. I call it orthogonal thinking. And in the orth orthogonal thinking, yeah, there is a way to have high quality, uh, which has high development costs, like a linear model, or they could have a low development cost resulting in a low quality product, which was in the traditional thinking, but it gives me two other options of having a high development cost, low quality, which is something that you want to avoid, or high quality and low development cost, which is a desire. And by thinking orthogonal, uh, impossibility basically eliminates. It's a possibility now to have it, and you start thinking, what are the items that helps me for this to become possible? At the end of the day, it might not be possible, but your frame of mind has changed from a 
linear way of looking at each problem as either they are helping each other or they are opposing each other to a more uh, uh, two-dimensional way of thinking. Uh, this uh, talk uh, has been a product of these books, basically. Some of them I have put uh, no heart, just ordinary, regular uh, reference books. Some of them have one heart, and some of them have two hearts that are my uh, favorite books, really. And uh, the two hearts book, as you can see here, down here, Thinking is Slow and Fast by Daniel Kahneman. Uh, another book that Daniel Kahneman wrote on the top is Noise, which is very interesting about how to collect the data. Uh, the one that on the left in the middle, How to Measure Anything, that was a very interesting uh, book for me that really changed my view on uh, how to measure, basically, parameters that you think from the beginning that there's no way I can I can measure this stuff, basically. And uh, that's the end of my talk. So what was the answer, by the way? I saw uh, Muhammad type, uh, Muhammad type uh, 50, 50. So I, I, I wasn't really on top of it with, 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 with the, with the, with the uh, poll. Sorry. Uh, we did have one other answer. Uh, Avi typed, uh, that the answer was, uh, why do you need to know if they have a dog? Yeah. <laughs> well, that was the question. See, this is the problem working with engineers, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> they every question by another question, you know. <laughs> what data do you really need? <laughs> yeah, yeah, see. <laughs> but I, I saw uh, Muhammad answer fifty percent. Muhammad, why did you pick fifty percent? Well, that was my unbiased answer. <laughs> exactly. That is your unbiased answer. I provide a lot of information in that paragraph that has nothing to do. It creates emotion in you, right? Yeah, they have one kid. They probably they have a dog because one, you know, kid being alone, dog is good. And then in one side, you could say, well, maybe financially they are not doing very well. Dog is costly. But in reality is none of those sentences is providing fact to you. So the answer to any question when you don't have fact and you are on bias is 50-50. <laughs> you start from there. You start from 50-50. And truly, I have that conversation every day with my boss. You know, he comes to my office and he says, how can we do that? And if it's something that I don't know about, I look at him. I said, 50-50, but give me another week. I can tell you better, you know. Uh, excellent. So, uh, yeah, any questions, uh, please go ahead and type them in the, uh, in the Q and a window and, uh, I will. Keep an eye out for them. Uh, um, first of all, um, fascinating talk. And, uh, this was an excellent example of a talk whose topic. Covers more than 1 chapter of likely to be, you know, we can. Take this the lesson learned tonight to any system or running any organization, and as well as uh, really running your own personal life. So very applicable lessons to all this. Uh, thank you, Hamid, for uh, preparing and presenting this uh, very informative talk. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs> I appreciate uh, that. I, I don't see any. I did send one. I did send one. Shahid. Okay. Let me see. Uh, it hasn't. At least I don't see it. I did. I I don't see a question. I see a uh, comments from uh, from Christopher that says uh, fantastic and informative, uh, amazing substantive talk. Thank you for sharing this valuable insight. And. Uh, Comment from Abdullah. Thank you very much for the great webinar. It was very informative. Uh, I did not see Shaheen's question, oddly enough. Yeah, I had a uh, I had a question for uh, Hamid. Yes, please. Uh, in in one of the earlier charts, 
he said, uh, in business, we cannot make decisions based on previous experiences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, the previous experiences, uh, some extent, form our bias. And bias is one of the inputs to your decision making process, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and I think previous experiences really uh, form the uh, the base the basis of our future decisions to, to a large extent. Um, you start with a um, with a starting point, which is our previous experiences, and uh, then we add the complexities of the new system to it and uh, go forward. So, could you explain uh, the meaning of that bullet head that you had? In that so, I, I was trying to be uh, extreme on that sentence, and the reason is because uh, as we have higher experience in our uh, work, we basically approach problems as, well, I have seen it before. But in reality, uh, no problem is like previous problem. Yeah. In the best case scenario, you have experience and your experience could tell you the relationship between parameters, but not really the outcome of it. Because they, at least minimum, the environmental has changed. So I'm trying to tell people that experience is a good thing. That's the gut's feeling also coming from experience, you know, but mm -hmm. it's, it shouldn't be the main decision making, you know. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just got a, a question. Uh, if you, if the uh, slide deck will be available, I know the recording will be available. Would you be willing to send the slide deck to me and I can include it? Of in course, of course. Package? I email it to you after this. Thank you so much. Okay. Shane had a question, but it doesn't go into the Q and A section. I don't. That is odd. Maybe you can just. She just walk over and ask it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, has if anybody it, been able to type questions? Uh, yes, everybody should be able to type. I've gotten uh, one so far. Uh, if you can't, if you can't, for some reason you can't type in the in the. If you pick the Q and A window, you should go ahead and pick all participants and that are all panelists, and that that'll uh, show up for me for all three of us. Okay. Or if uh, if that's a problem and you can't find it, uh, you can try the chat window. That one as well. Just send it to. Um, all panelists and uh, we'll figure it out. It does concern me a little bit because I have heard at least one person send me feedback before saying that they typed a question and, it, and I never saw it. But I have seen a couple things appear in the Q&A window and the chat window both. So it's at least working for some people, fingers crossed. <laughs> okay. Um... I guess if there are no other questions. Uh, no other questions. I uh, also just emailed you the presentation. All right, okay. excellent. Please. Yeah, I will. Uh, I will include that in our in our uh, uh, summary. Perfect. Send out to folks. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. It was my pleasure to be tonight uh, part of this talk. All right. Thank you. Thank you.
Bye. Thank Bye. you, Dave. Yes, thank a you. couple of the comments that uh, it's a very informative presentation. So thank you. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye.